Hey, you know, in life we have so many different roles that we play, so many different responsibilities that we carry. We're a husband or we're a wife, we're a son, we're a daughter, we're a teacher, we're a student, we're a boss, we're an employee. And all those roles come with responsibilities of paying the bills, doing our tasks, getting our jobs done, taking care of the house, raising the kids, washing the laundry, and all the other stuff that we've got to do. At some point, we need to really step back and say, what in the world am I living for? Like, what really matters in life? Like, why am I really here? And what is life all about? Well, in this teaching, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, where the Apostle Paul tells us the one thing, the one thing that really drove his life that he was living for, the main goal of his life that held everything else together, and he tells us it from his perspective so that it could be our one thing, our main thing we're living for as well. So what's the goal of your life? What's the main thing you're living for? Take a listen to this. Before we jump into uh, the passage of Scripture for the day, just want to direct your attention to a resource that uh, I think could be really helpful to you, and in a lot of ways goes right along with what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you can go over to my website, johnwhitaker.net, johnwhitaker.net slash courses, and there's a free course on there entitled How to Read the Bible and Pray, and along with that there is a uh, about a six-month Bible reading plan on there that might help you get started. So if you've ever struggled with uh, how to read the Bible and pray, or you know you ought to do it, you want to do it, or you're just looking for more ideas for how to read the Bible and pray and how to be consistent at it, that course is a, a pretty short, simple, little free mini course on on just some tips I've learned over the years about how to read the Bible and pray, how to do it consistently, why to do it. And I even give you a little bit of a model of how I've done it for a really long time. It's just one way to do it, not the only way, but at least gives you maybe a, a template or a pattern that you could use to help uh, read the Bible and pray. And with that, let's let's turn to the Bible today. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3. Uh, but just to kind of set that up, I was handed two books when I was in high school. One was titled The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. The other was titled The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. And those two books were given to me by a, a, a gal who was probably the age I am now when I was in high school. And she just uh, saw that I had a, a, a interest in God and the things of Jesus. And she was a mom and a follower of, of Jesus. And she had a son similar in age to me. And so she handed me these two books, hoping that they would be useful to my spiritual life. And she was dead on. These two books, The Pursuit of God and The Practice of the Presence of God, um, really fanned into flame my heart for God and made me want to seek God and pursue God and know God in a very real and passionate sort of way. And that's really at the heart of Philippians chapter 3 that we're looking at today. Paul is going to say that when his life changed, that became his drive, that became his passion to know Christ, to know God in Christ. And and if you're not super familiar with the Bible or uh, the story of, of Jesus and the apostles, let me just give you a little background to the Apostle Paul before we describe what happens to him, or he describes what happens to him uh, in this passage we're going to look at. The, the Apostle Paul was not always the Apostle Paul. He was Saul, the Jew, an up-and-comer in Jewish society. He uh, was sort of almost like the valedictorian of his class in rabbi school, and, and he was actually an opponent of Jesus and an opponent of the Christians. And you can read that story in Acts chapters 8 and 9, and, and in one of his uh, ventures to actually arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial, Jesus met him on his way to Damascus. And this is frequently referred to as Paul's Damascus Road experience. Well, Jesus actually appeared to him and it revolutionized Paul's life. All of a sudden he realized his assessment of Jesus had been wrong. His, uh, his assessment of Jesus had been wrong, and therefore his assessment of the Christians that he was persecuting had been wrong. And, and he uh, had to go back to the scriptures and rethink everything. And when he did, it precipitated for Paul a total reorientation of his life. A, a total reorientation of everything even that he, he valued. He had to rethink everything. And that's what he describes here in Philippians chapter 3. Listen to what he says. Philippians 3 verse 7, Paul says, But whatever things were gained to me, 
those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And Paul's actually seeming to use almost accounting terminology. I had all these things that I thought were assets for me, that were in the, the asset column, the gain column on the spreadsheet of my life. And then I met Jesus and I realized I was wrong about him. If Jesus was alive, risen from the dead, that meant he was vindicated by God. And indeed, he was God's son. He was who the Christians said they were. And so whatever things were in that asset column, that gain column for me as an up-and-comer in Jewish society, now Paul says, having met Jesus, those things I have counted as loss. I've moved them to the liability column. And I realized They're not all they're cracked up to be for the sake of Jesus. And so I have rearranged all my priorities, all my goals, all my values now around Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And if you look back in the preceding context, now you'll see some of the things that Paul counted as gain for him. Um, he describes in the earlier verses things like he was he was circumcised on the eighth day, just the way the law said it was supposed to happen. He was uh, of the nation of Israel. He was actually of the tribe of Benjamin, where the first king of Israel came from, named after the very first king. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he says, which meant uh, he spoke the Jewish language, the Hebrew language in his home, in the synagogue. He grew up with Hebrew culture. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He he was a Pharisee whose goal was to be as faithful to the law and as faithful to God and as pure and as holy as possible. Uh, he was so zealous for the law that he persecuted the church. These are some of the, the gains that Paul describes in the pre- preceding verses. And what he's essentially doing is saying, here's my religious stat sheet. Here are the things that all my countrymen would have looked at and they would have said, man, what a model Jew, what a, what a, what a perfect f- follower of Yahweh and keeper of the law that he, he, here's my religious stat sheet or here's my resume as a Jew. And Paul says, all those things in my earlier life before I met Jesus, those were gains to me. Uh, and, and then I met Jesus and it changed everything. Really, that raises the question for me, raises the question for you, what kinds of privileges, what kinds of accomplishment uh, can uh, cause us today to put confidence in ourselves, confidence in our accomplishments, confidence, what Paul says in the earlier verses, confidence in our flesh and our own ability, our own power, our own strength. What kinds of privileges and accomplishments can, can cause us to put confidence in ourself and our own abilities. And are we willing to move those from the gain column to the liability column if necessary for the sake of Christ? And that's exactly what Paul did when he met Jesus. He goes on in in Philippians 3, Paul does, and he says this, More than that, I count all things to be lost, not even just the gains, uh, but what, whatever else in life might come between me and Jesus, I count all things to be loss. Notice this, in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Like if I'm going to compare things, Paul says, uh, and I have on one hand knowing Jesus, and on the other hand, any and everything else I might get, I might accomplish, I might achieve uh, in life, if I, if I compare those two things, no matter how great, how seemingly valuable, how impressive all these other things might be that I could accomplish, that I could achieve, all awards, all recognition, all money and riches, all pleasure and fun, whatever it is, anything that that might be considered gains by the standards of society, if that's going to come between me and knowing Jesus, well, the value of knowing Jesus is so great, so, he says, surpassing that anything else is a liability, is a loss compared to knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then he says this, for whose sake, for whom I have suffered, notice that, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. For Paul, 
coming to Jesus was very much a costly venture, and he gave up a lot. He lost a lot. Uh, He lost his status in society. He lost his social standing, his social circle, his friend group. He lost all of that. Who knows the impact on his family since he grew up in a home that was very conservative Jewish uh, home. Who knows how they responded to him and uh, did they cast him aside? He, He may have lost that. Um, Certainly he lost privileges and even some position and power, maybe even a little bit of wealth. Um, We know from the stories of Paul in the book of Acts that he lost a lot of comfort and a lot of ease in life because uh, the mission Jesus called him to was very costly and very demanding. We know from Corinthians some of the things he suffered, the being whipped and beaten and shipwrecked and hungry and all of that. And Paul says, Uh, I actually have suffered the loss of all things for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of knowing him, serving him, and being uh, part of his mission to the world. So for whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things. What have you suffered? What have you given up for the sake of following Jesus? When you met Jesus, did did it precipitate for you this kind of reorientation of life where you, you had to say no to certain other things so you could say yes to Jesus and his mission. What have you suffered for the sake of Jesus and following Jesus and serving Jesus? Paul says, I've suffered the loss of all things. And then he goes on and he says, and I count them but rubbish. I count all these other things that, that by the world standards might be so great, so wonderful, so incredible. I count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. And that word rubbish is really a a very descriptive word in in Greek. The word behind it in Greek is skubala. And skubala is a very descriptive word. Um, It referred to maybe at the end of the season, grapes that had fallen off the vine and now were just kind of moldy, mushy, rotten mess on the ground underneath the grapevine. Scubala. Or if you've ever uh, been camping, gone into the outhouse and made the the fatal error of uh, looking down in the hole before you uh, before you went to the restroom. Well, that's what this word referred to, scubala. And Paul says, compared to knowing Jesus... Even all these really sometimes seemingly good things or wonderful things that uh, by normal human standards would have been considered, man, things to be pursued or valuable. Paul says, if I had to compare those with knowing Jesus, they're like scubala, they're rubbish, they're worthless filth uh, compared to knowing Jesus. So I've, I've reckoned everything. I've counted everything in that category so that I might gain Jesus, who is the highest value, the greatest prize, the most important goal in life is simply gaining Christ. 